All right. So we, uh, this is a 45 year old uh, lady uh, who presented with uh, a mass in the uh, abdomen. She herself felt actually this mass in her belly. Uh, she presented uh, to MD Anderson, uh, had this little bit discomfort and uh, the blood work was uh, normal except for that uh, high LDH, which uh, what uh, we discussed earlier is, a, is an indicator of high tumor burden. And you could see here on the CAT scan, this a huge mass with bulky, these are bulky lymph nodes, and this is a huge mass that's clearly uh, uh, not a candidate for laparoscopic surgery. It's a huge mass and uh, maybe involving uh, surrounding structures. So, um, Dr. Karam, and, uh, assuming this patient has, uh, uh, we said there is no metastatic disease to the brain uh, or bone, uh, and this is the, uh, would you consider looking at this? This is a uh, surgical candidate uh, for a nephrectomy or uh, would you treat her with systemic therapy? Would you do a biopsy? You were a proponent of uh, doing a biopsy before. What would you do? Uh, I would do a biopsy or just go straight for surgery if this is resectable. I mean, the patient is 45 years old with no medical problems and good performance status and no other metastases. So if it is uh, resectable if, after looking at everything else as far as the images, then I would go for that. Okay, showing you some more of the images. Mm. Do you think this is uh, resectable, Dr. Mateen? Well, you know, resectability is really sometimes um, an issue of how strongly the surgeon feels and what the patient is willing to go through. Um, but it does, it would require very extensive surgery and, you know, potentially the risk for taking a lot of surrounding tissue out and possibly leaving cancer behind. So okay. uh, I think if there's a clinical trial open, you know, we had a, a Chris actually had a neoadjuvant trial for his cases that were locally advanced. Actually, I'm not sure if she would have been eligible for it or not. Okay. Uh, but I, this would be a good candidate for that. On physical examination, uh, when the patient was referred to me, uh, she had a palpable left supraclavicular lymph node. Mm. Would that uh, change your approach? I would biopsy her. This patient has basically a large renal mass with lymph node only disease. I would be worried about papillary renal cell. And uh, with all this, I would probably not do surgery first. Okay. Dr. Wood, you think this patient. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think she's resectable, but can you go back one? On that first picture, you can see there's disease really, you know, right at the, um, uh, you know, right at the cruise. And I, I mean, I don't think you could render this patient disease free by, with surgery. I think that the magnitude of the surgery would be huge, even for a 45 year old, and so she'd be significantly debil debilitated and deconditioned after surgery. And I think it would be a race between her recovering and the cancer taking over, and I think the cancer would win. We don't want that to happen. Um, so, you mentioned here there is a disease in the, above the diaphragm, so another lymph node metastasis. This is small pulmonary nodule, so she, she has advanced disease with infradiaphragmatic and supradiaphragmatic lymph node metastasis and possibly lung metastasis. So the uh, patient was seen by Dr. Wood and he felt that uh, she has unresectable disease. We did biopsy as Dr. Karam uh, suggested and she had this rare uh, variant, uh, metastatic chromophobe. Again, th this is uh, in among 100 cases of kidney cancer, this would constitute 5%. Uh, and in patients who have metastatic disease, this is even less so. Maybe 2% of patients with advanced kidney cancer will have this histological type. Very uh, rare. But uh, luckily, uh, this is a disease, even when it is metastatic, it is slow moving disease compared to some other uh, tumors that we heard about this morning with you know, some of the uh, tumors that have sarcomatoid features with them. So this is a disease that even if it's advanced, uh, it uh, behaves in a, a more indolent fashion than some of the other types of kidney cancer. Uh, Dr. Pili, um, so she has metastatic chromophobe. Uh, you saw the scans. 
what systemic therapy would you recommend and why? Well, I would, I would, um, I would discuss with Dr. Wood whether this patient would still benefit from uh, uh, what we call a pallidine nephrectomy if a patient has any symptoms. Because, uh, you know, if even um, this patient has a lymphoma metastasis, but uh, a chromophobe, it, it tends to be a slow growing tumor where, you know, even removing the kidney would do any benefit. We, we're not going to cure her disease, but we're going to just take some of the tumor out. Um, I, I don't know, because systemically, we know that the, the drug that we have uh, um, in nuclear cell carcinoma, and Niza, you have uh, you published on this, and chromophore seems to work even less, you know, these drugs in this tumor. So, um, so I I would uh, would discuss the bit, but the first number qu question number one, whether or not uh, the tumor from the kidney uh, should come out, and I I don't know. Dr. Harrison, you have uh, an opinion about uh, systemic therapy uh, options? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree about thinking about debulking and whether that would benefit and having a serious conversation about that. But as far as systemic therapies, I think uh, Dr. Pilly mentioned well that it's not really clear what, you know, what the right option is. Um, certainly clinical trials could be an option. So, so your, your clinical trial and, and our clinical trial at Duke Aspen, you know, that could be a reasonable option because we don't know if the kind of anti-VEGF uh, approach with, say, sunitinib is a better option than, say, everolimus and mTOR inhibitor. Um, you know, so for me, I, I would, if, I, I guess regardless of what we did so, uh, locally, I would think about a clinical trial um, systemically. But suppose when none's available, what would you recommend? And then, um, you know, and this is just my personal bias, I would think about using sunitinib. Um, there is some data with sunitinib. Um, again, the response rate is probably not as high as with, with conventional clear cell carcinoma, but there may be some benefit. Dr. Wood, do you think this is resectable? Or? I think it says unresectable, if I can read. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't. I, I, I did not think this. I mean, there's a couple of issues here. First of all, cytoreductive nephrectomy has never been shown to be beneficial in the setting of non-clear cell histology. So that's, you know, right there, kind of off the ranch. And as I said, it, looking at those films, I do not think that we would be able to take all of the disease, disease out of her abdomen, but I do think it would be a major, major um, morbid surgery and, uh, uh, you know, lots of blood loss and, and a prolonged recovery. And I think that um, it's very likely that the cancer would progress faster than her, her recovery and she'd never get treatment. These are just out of curiosity. What was biopsied? What was, the, was it the primary tumor or the metastasis? It was the nose, I think. Okay. Yeah, there are some uh, genetic studies suggesting there might be some uh, protein called CKIT uh, that is um, is overexpressed in other type of tumor like Jaston. Uh, it is um, uh, in in the gut tumor in the guts, and and Sunitin, it does have some CKIT inhibition. So I, that would be my first choice. Um, I think what we, what we can say also about the, the bulk in nephrectomy in non-clear cell carcinoma, I totally agree with Dr. Wood. But the, the, the question, that the problem is these are much rarer disease than clear cell carcinoma, so uh, we don't have uh, the number of uh, patients to be studied to definitely have an answer about. So in, in my practice, I still go case by case, even non-clear cell carcinoma whether or not uh, the bulking, uh, uh, if a patient is symptomatic, uh, again, with, with the idea that we are not going to cure it. But if, um, if it can be done safely, and of course, I need to rely on the surgical expertise. So the, uh, after the discussion with Dr. Wood, uh, and we felt that he felt that uh, surgery is not uh, really, uh, uh, the disease is not resectable, we did a biopsy and we proceeded with enrolling her on a clinical trial for patients with non-clear cell, the, the less common type uh, types. There are several of these non-clear cell subtypes, so she got enrolled on that trial, and she uh, received sunitinib at full dose and tolerated it very well and uh, had a good response, actually, for about one year. And we'll, see, we'll show you some of the, uh, you, you, you recalled how big the mass 
was and how you know now it is definitely smaller and the bulky lymph nodes here um, they are definitely smaller and you could see that there is some plane now around the tumor where you know the surgeon can go in uh, and resect this with less morbidity and more confidence that you're going to be able to resect the, the tumor and maybe all the lymph nodes in the abdomen and render her NED without evidence of disease in the abdomen. Um, so she had a good response. Uh, Dr. Wood, would you uh, consider now surgery? Uh, absolutely. I would take her and do a cytoreductive nephrectomy and um, do an extensive lymph, lymph node dissection to resect the nodal disease. Um, did, did the patient have the same response in the lymph nodes? Yes. Did the patient? Yes. She had a response in the left supraclavicular lymph node as well as uh, the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. The small lung nodules remained stable. And yet, as you see, she had a good response in the primary tumor itself. Now, these are technical comments, uh, but this, I think, is, uh, is potential evidence that sunidin has a direct anti-tumor effect. Because if you believe a chromophobe is not driven by VHL and is not driven by VEGF, uh, I think probably the sunidine has a direct anti-tumor effect in this, in this chromophobe uh, patient. And I think a Through the secret inhibition. Maybe or, or other kinases that we get in the beach, but to me that's, that's compelling. Okay. But it's a great response. Okay. Dr. Karam, Dr. Mateen, uh, you agree yes, with uh, just going ahead and doing open uh, nephrectomy and retroperitoneal lymph node dissection? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the patient underwent a cytoreductive nephrectomy with uh, resection of all the lymph nodes, and the pathology uh, is uh, on the slides, T3A, N1, M1, chromophobe arena subcarcinoma <laughs> with matted nodes, and she had an uneventful postoperative course, was discharged five days later, but she was readmitted 16 days after surgery with chylus ascites, and this is a complication that I will ask Dr. Mateen to comment on. Dr. Mateen, would you like to briefly comment on uh, why this happens and how we treat this? Well, it wasn't my complication, but I'll still speak to it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Just kidding. No, I listen, I, whenever we do these uh, extensive removal of lymph nodes, this is one of the uh, known side effects or adverse events that can occur. Um, and basically, it's the lymphatic drainage and some of it which actually comes from the intestinal area. Um, and so, generally, the, the, the good thing with it is that we can, it, it's treatable, it just takes time sometimes. Uh, the first order of, uh, the first thing is to change the diet to a low fat or non fat diet or medium chain triglyceride. Um, in my, a lot of my cases, that's usually sufficient. If that doesn't work, you can try a drug, which is really expensive and it's questionable whether that works. And then ultimately, if none of those things work and they're still draining, you basically, restrict any form of diet, and you put the patient on IV nutrition, uh, which obviously is a kind of a big deal. Uh, but it can be done, and you can send patients home with it um, eventually, and, and in most cases that will suffice. But it, it, these can take time to, uh, to heal, and unfortunately it, it's one of the prices that one pays with you know, extensive surgery such as this. So uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, we do not resume systemic therapy with these target agents uh, for at least four weeks to allow complete recovery before we start sutent and the like because of the concern about wound dehiscence. So uh, and in some instances, we wait six weeks after surgery to resume these uh, therapies. So she, um, after she recovered from this complication, uh, uh, sunitinib was uh, uh, restarted and it was uh, the dose was reduced and uh, we, we gave it at uh, a slightly modified schedule. And despite uh, continuing with uh, therapy, she had mm -hmm. disease progression, again in the lymph node uh, chains, in the left supraclavicular area, as well as in the, under the diaphragm in the retrocrural space. And she started complaining of some back pain an MRI of the spine showed that there was a uh, tumor uh, uh, involving T7 vertebra. Uh, Dr. Harrison, what would you do now? Yeah, I might consider thinking about palliative radiotherapy to the T7, and then as far as systemic therapy, 
again, it's unknown what to do. I might favor a mechanistic switch, meaning switching from a VEGF receptor TKI like sunitinib to some uh, mTOR inhibitor, probably Everolimus, which is oral. Um, but I think no one, no one knows what to do here exactly. Okay. For sure. Dr. Pile, agree. Um, local therapy to the spine and then systemic therapy. Yeah, uh, yes, radiation and systemic. Um, uh, and again, I, I'm compelled. I, I'm, I think the response to sunidinib, at least initially, is pretty compelling. And I wonder whether uh, in this patient is young. Um, you could even try to dose escalate the sunidinib back to 50, uh, or switch into axidinib or pasapinib, the same type of drug, uh, because maybe the 37.5 is not a uh, high enough uh, drug. Um, um, I, I would probably, get, unfortunately, this patient is not kind of for immunotherapy. We don't know that, you know, the new immunotherapies come in the PD-1. Um, has any role in this uh, more rare disease, but I would probably try to dose escalate sunidinib or switch it to full dose pasapinib or exidinib. Okay. Well, you know, we uh, because of the the initial response. Yeah. So this patient participated in the clinical trial, as I mentioned to you, and uh, we had five patients with this rare tumor, chromophobe, on the trial, and two of the five had uh, a dramatic response. She was one of those two patients who had a dramatic response. So two out of five, small numbers, but 40%, uh, uh, which is what uh, we would expect of uh, this drug or similar drugs to achieve in patients with the most common type of renal cell carcinoma, the clear cell type. And uh, the median, which is the average uh, progression-free survival, that is how long the disease stayed uh, in partial remission or without progression, was 12.7 months on, uh, uh, in that study. So in our experience or in our view, uh, this rare uh, subtype of kidney cancer uh, that's, uh, that belongs to this non-clear cell group does respond in a similar or comparable way to the more common type clear cell to agents such as the, the one that she received. I think there are some retrospective analysis. My understanding was Chromophobe tend to respond even less than palpability to uh, TKIs, but but uh, there's something going on in this patient maybe. But I think uh, even send that as a case report because I think uh, it, it may induce patient, I mean uh, physician to still try sunidinib. You know we're going to know more about uh, the um, the ongoing clinical trial, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. Probably so you're not going to have a lot so of there are two trials looking at the, the same uh, yeah. group of non-clear cells, the, the rare subtypes. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the Aspen trial uh, led by Duke and the ESPN trial led by, by MD Anderson and basically treating this, those patients with uh, sunitinib versus everolimus. So uh, we elected to treat her with everolimus, uh, 10 milligram a day. She had stereotactic radiosurgery to the T7 uh, uh, metastasis and her back pain resolved. She's still receiving Everolimus now past one year uh, without any significant toxicity. She is still maintaining uh, active lifestyle and working. Uh, uh, but uh, 18 months later, while she's still on therapy with Everolimus and uh, her disease is under control, she showed up in Dr. Wood's clinic. Uh, he was happy to see her. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but uh, she said, no, it's not for me this time, it's for my husband. So she brought her husband, and her husband uh, was uh, diagnosed with kidney cancer. Uh, mass will show you the, the scans. Uh, he had a left renal mass, a mass in his left kidney, and on chest x-ray and subsequent, subsequent CAT scan of the chest, he has metastatic disease to the lymph nodes in the chest. The rest of his uh, workup was negative and the blood work uh, was normal. Now his um, uh, review of system is negative except that he has uh, hyperlipidemia and hypertension. And here is the mass in the left kidney. And, and then here you can see the uh, lymph node. Dr. Karam, what would you recommend? And these are the only sites of metastatic disease? Yeah, his disease? performance status is, is basically zero. Again, I would discuss the option, but to give you a brief answer, I would uh, go for a cytoreductive uh, nephrectomy on the left side. 
Is there a uh, possibility you could do a partial here? Or? Uh, there is a possibility, but uh, given that the patient will start targeted therapy probably after surgery, I will try to do the operation with the least uh, possible side effects. Uh, and again, that doing partial nephrectomy in the setting of metastatic disease, it's been reported in at least uh, three studies, very small studies, it's doable. But typically, these have been patients who have one kidney or uh, one functioning kidney. So if the mass is small, I would consider it, but f I don't see a compelling reason to do it in this patient. So you would do a uh, laparoscopic robotic-assisted robot -assisted left radical nephrectomy? Just a laparoscopic left radical nephrectomy. Okay. All right, Dr. Mati? Yeah, I agree. Okay, you agree. All right. The other thing I would tell him to do is put his house up for sale and move as far away from there as possible. <laughs> All right, so the patient underwent a laparoscopic cytoreductive nephrectomy, and the pathology uh, was uh, consistent with T3A and 0M1 clear, uh, clear cell carcinoma. so different subtype of cancer than his wife, who had chromophobe, if you recall. Uh, he had metastasis to the resected left adrenal gland. Um, Dr. Pile, what would you recommend now? And if he's a candidate for IL-2, I would offer in the, if it was in Buffalo, I would offer in the clinical trial that we have. Okay, Dr. Harrison? Yeah, I mean, I think he's, he's young. It looks like he's a candidate. I would offer him high dose interleukin too. Okay, all right. So we, we uh, uh, did offer him that, but he elected to be treated with target therapy and uh, he is enrolled on the STAR trial and was randomized uh, to first-line therapy with Everolimus. So him and his wife are taking the same medication, both tol tolerating it very well, and he's, he's shown already tumor regression response now six months since he, he was enrolled on the trial. We'll do one more case, and then I think we can wrap it up and you know, open it up for questions again. This is the last case we're going to uh, discuss. 62-year-old uh, uh, male with uh, blood in the urine, uh, diabetes and high blood pressure, had uh, appendectomy and knee surgery, um, examination unremarkable, uh, no tobacco or alcohol uh, use, and uh, imaging studies showed a locally advanced right renal mass and spots in both lungs, so pulmonary metastasis. Here is the mass, and then here are the pulmonary nodules, here and here, here. So at least uh, several in both lungs. In addition, he has anemia, so low hemoglobin. Uh, the uh, brain and bone uh, were negative. Biopsy of this uh, lung, uh, one of the lung lesions, uh, confirmed the diagnosis of metastatic leucine sarcosinoma. So I think in the case of time, we'll just move on quickly here. So what he has is anemia, and he's presenting with advanced disease with primary tumor in place, so he has two risk factors. So he falls in the category of intermediate risk. So he has this here by the memorial uh, risk classification, uh, as well as the more modern uh, classification that uh, has been <coughs> developed in the era of target therapy. He has what we refer to as intermediate risk disease. So Dr. Mateen, would you offer this patient cytoreductive nephrectomy up front? Yeah. Dr. Karam, different uh, opinion? No, yes, I would uh, still do the surgery. Okay, Dr. Wood, agree, okay. Uh, my medical oncologist colleagues, <laughs> surgery, okay. So he, underwent, he undergoes surgery and it's uneventful now. Uh, what systemic therapy would you consider for this patient? Um, he, assuming he recovered completely and postoperatively has mild anemia, uh, but his perform status is good. I would consider high dose IL-2 first, um, assuming that it was available at my institution because, again, this is a young guy, low volume, lung only metastases. Um, I think he'd be a great candidate for high dose IL-2, barring that. Um, I think that the best evidence would suggest that he should start on either sunitinib or pazopinib, either one. Dr. Pile? Uh, we already heard from the medical oncologist, <laughs> so I don't need to add anything. Right. Exactly what I would say. Okay. Uh, Dr. Harrison? I agree. So we're all in, we want to all be aggressive and treat him with high dose interleukin too? I agree with our three or medical oncology colleagues. 
really. Offer it to him, <laughs> Dr. Mate. Ditto. Okay. All right, we can stop here, and we have a few minutes uh, uh, to ask any questions, uh, make any comments. And then um, Carrie wanted to say something. Brian, could you get Carrie in here? Any other questions related to what we talked about or any other questions outside of what we talked about? Is there anything that we didn't cover that you have questions about? Please don't hesitate to ask. So what do we think about the format? The, yeah, go ahead. Uh, quick, quick, I guess it'll be kind of outside of what we've discussed. Mm -hmm. um, how, how concerned should we be as patients of um, the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments are welcome. It depends I mean, on whether you're going to continue having insurance or not. I mean, it, I, I think mean, there's, there's real concern. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, their concern goes both ways. And I'm not sure how much we want to get into this, but, you know, the problem is, which whether you realize it or not, all of you who are here probably have the luxury of being able to afford insurance. But the truth, the, you know, the, the ugly truth about medical care here is that there's two tiers. And there's a huge population of patients who get their care through the emergency room. Um, and so, you know, to, to try to address that and at the same time contain costs, which everybody agrees is out of control, some of which has contributed, I think, you know, my, my personal opinion is that there's a preponderance of greed uh, across the entire medical spectrum. Um, and it starts with patients and doctors and insurance companies and politicians and, and drug companies. Uh, patients want every test done sometimes. Uh, doctors get insecure, so we order everything. Um, so anyway, it, it's across the board, and nobody wants to give up anything. And so all of that adds to, to, to the issue of rising costs in care. Um, but the ugly truth, and I don't know the solution, but the ugly truth about medical care here, as good as it is, is that um, there are patients who are dying from inability to afford care and from preventable conditions. Do you all see, see um, the, the possibility of um, the cost of, I mean, these new drugs and, uh, and where we've come is, is, is wonderful and it's great. It's benefited all of us. Uh, but it comes out at a very high cost, again, as we know. Um, do we see that being hampered as far as these future? You know, we're talking about things, we always, we, we're always talking about things upcoming, you know, or those things in, in jeopardy. You know, the research, the research dollars, is, is, is that a hindrance? Is, is this going to be a hindrance on? Yeah, I mean, I think all those issues are, are, are you know, very real. I mean, the, the cost of these agents that have revolutionized the outcome for patients is astronomical. And, you know, I think with Obamacare being instituted, um, the, we're going to have to make choices, and those choices are going to be very difficult ones, you know, and <clears throat> I think that we're going to have limited access to these agents. I think that, um, you know, with this comparative effectiveness, that some of these agents are going to go by the wayside because they don't, they're not better or they're not, you know, even though they're different, they're just not better, so they're not going to be used. And I think that, um, you know, it's going to be a real challenge. I think that it's sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we have these great drugs that can potentially cure cancer, but we really can't afford to use them. We're already seeing, as I mentioned earlier this morning, where we're getting really denials from insurance companies. So it's going to get worse with insurance companies, a, a clerk or a, a bureaucrat on the, on the other uh, side of the line, the telephone line, uh, basically dictating to us what tests we order and what treatments to give. And it may get worse. Um, I think, you know, we have to really be prepared uh, for this, uh, where we may not be able to give the uh, successive, like you heard, you know, we, we, we treat people sequentially, uh, but we, we may get to a point where, like in Europe or Asia, where some of these drugs, we have all the drugs available to us. Uh, and in Europe, you know, uh, they may have only two or three and they may not be able to go back using what worked for the, for the patient in the first line for, say, two or three years. They cannot go back to that drug again because they say you can use it only once. So it, it's going to impact. There's no question it's going to impact our uh, 
uh, ability to uh, order tests and uh, treat the way we think is best for the patient. And I think, you know, I mean, not, the, the issue is that it's hard to have a frank, you know, what we want to really have is a good discussion and patients need to get involved to some degree and, and uh, you know, the whole population because everybody's going to have to give up something, you know, uh, and no, nobody wants to give up anything. And on top of that, you have this chaos created by extremes in both political situations um, where there's basically a lot of unsupported claims being made uh, for the sake of poli gaining political ground. And, I, and we all stand to lose a lot from that. Um, and, you know, when I mean everybody has to give up something, you know, in some ways it may mean physicians having to accept becoming middle class people like they were back in the 50s and 60s. It may mean you all having to accept fewer choices uh, and maybe not having the option of paying several thousands of dollars for an extra two months of life. That sounds harsh, and I don't mean it to be harsh, but that's where that discussion, you need to tell us, is that worth it from a societal perspective? I, I, and listen, my family, yeah, I'm going to say, if it's my family, I'm going to say, hell yeah. But really, if we can distance ourselves and look at that from a global perspective, that, that's the kind of population level decisions that, you know, these are things people talk about. But, you know, it's hard to have that discussion uh, because there's these incredible extremes, uh, political extremes, that drown out where most of us stand, which is somewhere near the center. I, I find that to be a real shame right now. Well, now that Dr. Mateen has totally bummed us all out. Um, <laughs> Carrie, why don't you come up and, uh, and talk a bit about the Kidney Cancer Association. Oh, is there another question? I'm Aren't you so glad you asked that sorry, question? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, it's just that I want to know if there is any evidence that this is hereditary. Could it go down to the kids or down in the line grandkids? There are, I mean, there are genetic syndromes that are associated with kidney cancer. They're rare. Sporadic is much more common. We typically don't worry about it unless there are two first-degree relatives that have kidney cancer. We also worry about it in patients who present at a very young age with kidney cancer. Those are sort of uh, warning signs to us that there could be a genetic syndrome. But the vast majority of cases are sporadic, not, not inherited. But it is tough. I mean, there is probably some familial predispositions. We saw a case earlier where there was three you know, family members, and of course you think von Hippel Lindau, but you know, a lot of times the, the tough thing also is that the family could have had the same exposure to product, whatever it was in the environment or diet that put them all at risk. Um, and that's one of the hard things. Uh, we have a researcher here who actually collaborates with, with us, and she's an, a molecular epidemiologist. And Chris, I don't remember the exact finding from that study, but if you remember, she was actually able to show that if you have kidney cancer in the family, it does predispose to the rest of the family, you know, being at a higher risk for developing it. Yeah, the risk is like five fivefold increased risk. Yeah, so you know, not not uh, not something small, um, but so I think it points out the fact that there's probably some genetic predispositions that some people have that we still don't know exactly what they are, but then when you add to that something in the environment we're exposed to, that that could I think that means I need to stop talking. No, no, I just wanted to, I, uh, Nancy asked the question earlier to me during the break, but um, there are some red flags or some, uh, uh, you know, factors or variables that when we see uh, in a patient that basically rings the bell. And for, uh, for further evaluation to study if there is really an inherited syndrome, and th these are three. Uh, first, you know, uh, having kidney cancer at a young age. Secondly, having uh, tumors in both kidneys. And thirdly, if there are multiple tumors in, in, uh, in the kidney or in both kidneys. So if you have that, a family history, young age, both kidney tumors, both tu uh, tumors in both kidneys, uh, multiple, you know, those four things, then one would then need to consider one of these uh, uh, inherited syndromes. And you know, beyond the VHL disease and the uh, uh, papillary, uh, type 1 inherited syndrome and the uh, hereditary leiomyoma, renal succarcinoma syndrome, papillary type 2. There is a recent uh, uh, syndrome uh, that has been uh, uh, BAP1, uh, characterized by BAP1 mutation. So I think 
that there are <coughs> those things that we may discover more families, more inherited syndromes. But you, one would not think about it or worry about it if there is no family history at all, and, and it's an uh, occurrence at 60 years of age or older, and it's just typically unilateral, one lesion in the kidney. 